You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. And I'm Jared Mounts with Jake's Bait and Tackle. And uh, Thomas, we got Steve Chaconis with us today. Um, he's been at this a long time. And... Uh, He's, he's tenured, he's, he's experienced, and uh, has a guide service. Uh, I believe the Potomac River is your your specialty. Right, tidal and Potomac. Basically. Tidal Potomac. Yeah, from D.C. South. Very good. Uh, maybe just tell us a little bit about yourself, Steve, for the viewers and listeners that, that may not know you. How much time do we have? We got all day. <laughs> so when Fox News came out, when Chris Wallace came out to interview me for the Power Player of the Week, I had had clients out the day before that every time they hit a piece of grass, they thought it was a fish and they'd set the hook. So I was dodging spinner baits and everything else all day. Why well, I didn't dodge one and it hit me like right there, you know, mm. so I had this big black eye. So I had my sunglasses on. I had the hat down. Yeah. You know, Chris Wallace says, uh, Hey, tilt your hat back a little bit. I'm like, okay, how's that? He says, I dropped your glasses. I went like this. He goes, oh my, what the heck happened to you? I thought fishing was a non-contact sport. And I said, well, I, you know, I caught a spinner bait. He goes, makeup. And this little girl comes running out of the trailer, comes over and starts putting makeup on me. And it, it, she did a good job. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't tell which eye it was. And my mother couldn't tell it was me. So it worked out really well for both of us. <laughs> But I, I've been lucky. I, I've, you know, I talk about, you asked me about other things that I've done. I've done a lot of stuff. Uh, had had a lot of fun. I worked for a big, uh, uh, big radio station, a big show up in New York City for a while. And I uh, was able to do some stuff there. And uh, so, yeah, I'm having fun. But, you know, every step of the way, the, the skills that I had were uh, sales and, oh, hi. How's, you're going to hold that the whole time? I, my skills were like, I always had sales, sales experience and, uh, and teaching. And so I kind of combined both because uh, the sales part of it is getting people to agree with you. I mean, that's what sales is, getting people to agree with you. So I get people out there and I go, you should throw a spinner bait. And they're looking at me going, a spinner bait? Well, that, that just looks like wires and stuff, you know. What do the fish think it is? And I go, well, they, they bite it. So you have to sell somebody on that. But then you also have to give them step by step stuff, stuff that's easy to digest and you know stuff that they'll they'll remember. And I I try to do that with my with my YouTube channel. I, I I don't get out there and I have in the past gone out there and say, oh, look, I caught another fish and then splice at it. Oh, look, there's another fish. Splice at it. Oh, there's another one. Boy, I'm on him today. Splice at it. Hey, look, I got another. One. I've done that. I don't think it helps people learn. And so I try to make sure they can learn how to fish. I try to teach you the fundamentals. I don't talk about a spinner bait or a brand. I'll say, look, you have three, three blades. You have a willow, you have a Colorado, you have something in between. It's an Indiana. Here's what, how you use them. And I bring everything back to depth and speed. You know, everybody has to do that. But I start everybody off the same way. I have what I call a fishing triangle. And the base of the triangle is the most important skill set. And that's learning to cast. I don't care what kind of fishing you're doing or who you're out with or what they're biting on. If you can't cast, you're not going to catch them. And I teach people how to cast the spinning, the bait casting, pitching, skipping, uh, any kind of cast that they're going to need to. And I explain the long cast, the short cast, and then I explain the rods and everything that's involved in that. And the next level up of that triangle is lure presentation because Jerry could be throwing a lure and catching fish and I might not be catching him because he's doing something a little bit different. So lure presentation is making the fish bite. And we talk about fishing lures as tools. And a lot of anglers look at fishing lures as like, oh, I got to have that lure. Well, fishing lures don't catch fish. Fishing lures catch fishermen. Good fishermen learn how to use those tools to catch fish. And that's what I, I try to teach on that next level. The next level up is what I call angling skills. And it's broken up into parts too. It's, it's like detecting a strike. You know, what is the bite? What is it? It's different for every lure. With a topwater, you can see the bite. With a plastic worm, you got to kind of like feel that bite. And with other lures, you know, they'll yank the rod out of your hand. So you got to recognize that that bite for the type of lure that you're using. And then from there, 
you got to know the right hook set. The hook mm-hmm. set for a drop shot is not the same as it is for a jig. A Carolina rig is different than a spinnerbait. Topwater different than a, hot, you know, a popper from a frog. So you teach those. And then it's like, how do you get the fish to the boat? And I have mm-hmm. another triangle. I call it the fighting triangle. Yeah, you know, when that fish is down away from you and you see that line angled down, you keep the rod up and you're pulling that fish up. And when he, that line starts to flatten out, that means the fish is going to jump. You take that rod to the opposite corner of the triangle and then you go ahead and, and apply pressure that way to keep them from jumping or you go to the other side. And then I have this really tiny, tiny little spot uh, on that triangle and that's removing hooks from yourself. So that's something else you need to do. Because sometimes you have to do it when you're when you're a guide. You you can take them out of your clients, but you know you, your clients are like, oh, it's too bad you got a hook in you. Where do I cast now? You know, so you have to learn how to take hooks out by yourself. So this is a well thought out deal. I found that as part of my business model as a guide, that if I teach you how to fish and you're successful in learning how to catch fish, then you're going to get better and you're going to want to come back. And you're going to you know, do what we'd like you to do, spend more money on the sport, which is ultimately what my job is, whether it's to spend it on one of my sponsors or just on anything in general. As a guide, as someone who has contact with people, you've got to be able to get them to buy stuff. Steve, you mentioned a couple of interesting things like 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 the splice the, the splice edit, and then you're not going to name the brands and everything. And, and you've been around you've been around once or twice with this. Why is it so many people in the industry do a hard sell versus a soft sell? I think of like Tactical Bastin, who's like they're not sponsored by anybody, but they say like we think this works, and I feel like there's a trust there. Why, why is it people don't do that more? Like 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 you're saying. Well, you, you have to go back a few decades. Uh, you would have a guy that's fishing a tournament and he's catching all these fish. His co-angler in the back of the boat says, hey, he was using a Strike King jerkbait, but he's sponsored by Lucky Craft. So when the writer comes over and goes, what were you catching your fish on? He goes, oh, I, was, I was throwing a Lucky Craft jerkbait. Well, the only guy who knew was the, the co-angler and he's not going to say anything. So he started this, this lie and these guys never got into... And again, it goes back to being a good salesman. If you start with features, advantage, and benefits, you can the product will sell itself. If you're trying that hard sell and you don't have any reason for it, and and I'm also I'm also an outdoor writer, so I'm on the, I, I flip my hat around and I'm interviewing these pros, and they can't tell you why the Lucky Craft jerk bait works better than a Strike King jerk bait. They don't know. The guys at Tactical Bass, and those guys are great because, like you said, they're not sponsored. They're not promoting a, a particular bait. If it works, they tell it. A lot of guys are so desperate to keep sponsors. It's much more competitive than it used to be, and the, and what you get now is not as much as it used to be. So they like that hard sell. A lot of the sponsors like it, but I think it's, it's self-defeating because if you can figure out there's something wrong with it, then everybody else is going to figure it out, too. And it's kind of counterproductive. So how did you learn? Like you were talking about computers before, and obviously the information age now with, with YouTube and internet. Like, so did you have anybody teach you or how did you learn? Because I really like what you just went through with all that. But you know, how how did you learn uh or get to where you're at now? Like, did you have a mentor or that you know, that's a really good question. And and I yeah, my grandmother. My grandmother, you know, you, if you're raised right, those things happen. I, you know, I, my grandparents had a restaurant and they would say, OK, vacuum. It's your, you, you've got to vacuum. We, we got to clean up after everybody's been here. We got to get ready for tomorrow. And I'd vacuum. And my grandmother would call me over. She goes, you know, I pay rent underneath that table, too. So do the whole job or don't do it at all. So I learned how to learn. I learned how to see things ahead. Uh, of the, the reaction and interaction of everything you do. Uh, like I said, you know, if you could teach high school cheerleaders algebra, I think you could do anything. And and I did. I I was able to, uh, the blonder, the better. You know, I was able to, to reach out to, to all of them, you know, go, go, go. And I could teach them. But again, I w- had all these jobs in sales and I was in sales back when they used to teach you everything. They, they taught you how to dress uh, they taught you how how to get fitted for a suit, what you should have in your briefcase, how to polish shoes. They brought a guy in from the airport to teach us how to shine our shoes. So 
Wow. You know, I've learned a lot over the way. So I came into the business. Basically, I was looking around going like, well, heck, I can compete with these guys. Maybe not on the water, but off the water. I felt like none of these guys can do what I do because of my background. I was able to do all these things and all the skills that I had, primarily the sales part of it. Because the hardest sales job that anybody ever has is selling themselves. And I had to do that all the time. I went in for a job interview, right? I went in for a job interview one time and this guy is there and he was doing an interview every 15 minutes. They interviewed over 6,000 people uh, for about six, seven months. They narrowed it down. And about a year later, they decide on who got the job. But one of my one of the questions that he asked me, I'm sitting at the table and he was kind of like bored by this time because he already interviewed about 200 people. So he pulls out his pen and he hands me the pen and he says, sell me this pen. I said, OK. I said, you look like a really smart guy and you've got a lot of responsibility, right? Yeah. You got like a lot of people who work for you, right? Yeah. Do you have to, to, to write down things and take notes, right? He goes, yeah. And I said, can I borrow your pen? And he went like this. And I went, I got one for you right here. And so I got the job. I got the job. And, you you know, those kinds of things, you can't teach people. You've got to do it. And I learned when I was in Boy Scouts. And yes, I was an Eagle Scout. I learned then uh, how to sell. They had a hatchet that I wanted. What does it cost? An East Wing or S Wing or whatever the, the, the hatchet was. I wanted that hatchet. And the guy who got that hatchet was the one who sold the most tickets to this pancake breakfast. When we go to this pancake breakfast, there were 200 people there. I sold 150 of the tickets. So they're all pointing me going, I bought mine from that guy. And, you know, I wanted it. I saw that if I worked hard, that I was going to be able to get it. I do the same thing for my sponsors as a writer, as a broadcaster, as a website. You know, I have a, a pretty decent website of a lot of stuff on there. I work with industry people, helping them promote their product, even if it's not one that I use. Uh, so I know how to how to do that. I put it to good use and, and I work hard. And you'll find that the guys I just talked to Ish Monroe last week and we were talking about uh, working with sponsors. And he, he told me all the things that he does off the water to help his sponsors. And there are a lot of guys that don't do that. They call up a company and say, I'll wear your hat and put a, I'll put a sticker on my truck. You know, that doesn't do it. You've got to be able to go to the extra yard and work for the tackle shop, make tackle shop appearances, which I tell you what, there are not many tackle shops left. Uh, to have a tackle shop, uh, the, the tackle shop that you guys work with is, it's amazing, you know, because I people ask me, they go, where do you where do you get equipment? Where should I go for, to shop? We well, can't go to Bass Pro Shops. They don't have, they don't have anybody there that knows what they're doing. Mm -hmm. You can't you can't go. You can't go to any of the big box stores. And those big box stores put all the mom and pops out of business. And it's the mom and pops that have the anglers working there. The angler's going to say, you should try this. Well, what size hook do I need? Well, you need a three up. What size mm -hmm. weight? Well, it depends on how you're, you know. So mm -hmm. we, we need the local tackle shops. And I wish more bass fishermen uh, who fish on a regular basis would put down their laptops and walk into a tackle shop and buy something there. It could be just a bag of worms. But go in and show a little bit of support. Because I, I was around when we used to have, like, every five miles on, on Richmond Highway going from Alexandria to Woodbridge, we had a tackle shop. Now, mm -hmm. zero, none. We don't have any. No, it, that's just, that's crazy. Cause I mean, you hit the nail on the head. Something that like, Jared, I told you, like when I first started this, like attacking it from the business side, not the fishing side. Cause mm -hmm. that's something I saw like, five, six years ago when I finished college fishing. It's like, it's only the 1% can actually go out there and fish and make a living. You have to, mm -hmm. you have to attack it from the other side. And that's the business side. Um, what, what is the industry like now compared to 10 years ago? Is it harder? Is it more diluted? Is the money drying yeah, up? Everything. Well, you know, you can start off at the top, you know, when, you know, 10 years ago you had FLW and you had Bassmaster BASS. Now you've got major league fishing. And I talked to some of the industry, uh, insiders when that split happened and they only have their budget is X and it was divided between two. Mm -hmm. Now, all of a sudden, their budget was X, but now it has to be divided with three. But how do we do that? Where did our anglers end up going? We don't want to be sponsoring a tournament trail that's all with brand X and we're brand Y. We'll be outnumbered there if we only have one angler and they got 50. So that's been a big challenge for them as well. The Internet has created more opportunities, but it's also diluted 
things. Uh, there, anybody with a laptop, you know, does a YouTube. Uh, I remember the first time I, I won't mention his name, but the first time I, I said, what is YouTube? And I was on a, a fishing trip up in Minnesota because this guy was like, he go like, uh, oh, you put your boots on. I want to get a video of that. All right, take them off. Okay, you put yours on. You take yours off. You carry your luggage. Okay. He was shooting, you know, just popping stuff out there. And the guy ends up with like a zillion hits and followers and zips and zaps and everything else that comes with it. So there are a lot, there's a lot of that out there. So it has to be meaningful. You yeah. know, I remember one of my bosses said something. He said, you can be a wandering generality, but it's better to be a meaningful specific. So all this stuff they just throw out there and they hope it hits the fan and it doesn't. Uh, you're better off if you can really establish something that's going to be a lot more concrete, more value, staying in touch with your sponsors. I Mine get uh, uh, something in the mail every every month, no matter what it is. It could be picture me in a magazine. It could be an article I wrote. It could be anything that you can think of. Anytime I mention their product or find a new way to, to mention their product, I let them know and I stay in touch. Now, the problem that guys like me are having now is the lady that I worked for for 20 years with one company gets replaced. So you go, oh, I got to establish a relationship with somebody new. They're there for a year. Then you got somebody else new. And after a mm -hmm. while in, in that 20 year period, I had one person. And then the next 10 years, I had 10 people. Mm -hmm. So staying in touch and following it, but it's also a small industry. The guy that you knew who worked at 13 Fishing leaves 13 Fishing and now is with uh, Z-Man. And so you have a contact there. And uh, so you have to stay in touch with people. You can't burn bridges. You have to attend. If you really are serious about this, you need to go to ICAST. If you don't know what it is, look it up. Go to ICAST. Meet everybody. Shake a hand. Say howdy. And mm -hmm. let the people know who you are and how serious you are. I mean, I'd say when I, 20 years ago, when I really was out there pounding the pavement for sponsors, maybe 25 years ago, uh, ICAST. I did it all at ICAST, you know, spent the money. Well, actually, back then, uh, companies would send me to go to ICAST. And I'd say, look, can I have a couple hours to walk the floor? And they'd say, sure, go ahead. That's where I met most of my sponsors. My very first sponsor, I always, I always mention them, Silver Buddy. Silver Buddy was my very first sponsor. And I bad. learned, well, you used them? Yeah, they're, they're great bait. And, uh, you know, and they don't have a lot of competition because I can't imagine somebody going into a uh, and going into a boardroom and saying, I got a great idea for a lure. Uh, they only use it for like one month and uh, they get hung up all the time. And, uh, it, 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 you know, and it, you got to you lose a bunch of them. And, you know, and it's just and you're in, in competition with nobody. But nobody wants to do that. So Silver Buddy pretty much owned that that racket. And uh, they were great people. Good old guys from Kentucky. We're still friends today. Uh, Buddy Banks and his wife, Mary, and I, we talk to each other a good bit. and uh, We share information, but it's uh, you always remember your first kiss and your first sponsor. Mm. That for you, you guys, it might be the same person, so I don't know. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not. I mean, it really what, what was really interesting, just like, again, that's why I love doing this long form content like this is with your background, you have been able to evolve with everything. When YouTube came around, so many people we've interviewed, so many people I talked to completely like snubbed their nose at it and and didn't adapt to it. And it seems like everything that came in front of you, you've been able to adapt to it. Yeah, sometimes I'm a little bit slow. Uh, this company came to me. It was called Monkey C, monkeyc.com. And what they did is they took experts in, in an area and they would do videos. And so it was like this, you, if you wanted to learn how to sew or cook or fish, you go to this site. So they said, well, uh, how much do you charge for videos? And I said, I don't know. Well, you can pay me for a, a guide trip. He goes, well, what's that? And I said, that's $400. They said, okay. So they came out there. They storyboarded this whole thing and they had everything there and they gave it to me and I did it in one take. And they went like, well, it's like 10 minutes. Uh, you got anything else? So I shot like another 15 videos for them while we were there. Wow. So I went in to interview for Comcast. Comcast wanted to hire me to do some fishing reports. And the guy there I, I knew from radio, and he wanted me to do some TV and take out some of the athletes and stuff like that. This never panned out because NBC bought them or something anyway. So he moved on. But they wanted me to do it. So I'm in there with all the suits. And they're saying like, uh, well, do you have any broadcast experience? And so my guy said, oh, yeah, Steve was in radio for 20 years, did you know TV, local TV, did reporting and that kind of thing. And 
they go, do you have anything we can see for, for video? And I went, well, you have this thing on monkey see. So the guy looks at it. He's like, oh, my, that's impressive. I'm like, I'm talking about how to pitch a drop shot. I mean, how impressive is that? And he goes, no, you had like over a million views. And I go, is that good? And back then, a million was really a million, you know. Now yeah. it's all bots and everything else. But, you know, it was, it was real views. So I learned then that I gave away something that had some value. And I was used to do a lot of seminars and I found that that when COVID hit, I had to do a lot more of these type of things where we're talking through a through a computer, not in the same room. And I did seminars that way. And people go like, oh, you should do a video on that. You should do a video on that. And the guy used to shoot all my videos moved. And I said, I better start doing my own videos. So I started I started about three or four years ago, and then I dropped it because I got too busy. Now I have a little bit more time, so I'm, I'm doing, a, doing a couple of weeks. And um, it's not the kind of video that, uh, that you see out there. You'll either see, like I said, where people chop together fish catches and they go, oh, look, I caught all these fish with a special bait. Uh, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's not necessarily all classroom. I try to talk about things that either people haven't talked about before or that they've talked about it, but they've left stuff out. You know, I, like I talk about, yeah, I did a video yesterday about tuning a spinnerbait. And before I even got to that, I pulled a piece of wire out and I, and I said, this is how you keep your spinnerbait skirt from coming off. You take this wire, you wrap it around the collar, you twist it, you cut it. So now you have a wire holding your spinnerbait skirt. In. Then I talked about tuning the spinnerbait, getting the arm, upper arm and the lower arm lined up. But then I also talked about the hook point and the line tie getting those in the same plane so that when you set the hook, you have the force in the same direction. A lot of people don't think about that. I went fishing with a guy today and I said, did you tune that spinnerbait? And he gets, gets it out of the water. He goes, me, 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 me. I go, no, that's not how you tune the spinnerbait. You got to bend it right like that. So uh, I try to come up with things that people are embarrassed to ask about. And I, and I always picture when I'm doing it, when I used to do a lot of in-person seminars, when I, I used to ask questions, I go, how many of you know that you're supposed to close the bail of the spinning reel before you, before you start to reel, close it by hand, mm-hmm. you know, and you see like two or three hands go up and everyone else is taking notes. I'm like, you don't know that, you know, and I started to think that there are a lot of people out there fishing on a fairly regular basis. And I'm not talking the tournament guys and all that. I'm talking people are just, you know, they, they like to fish. Maybe they take their kids fishing. And they don't know how to do something. They don't know how to teach it because we all learn through a process called trial and error. Mm-hmm. And error and error and error and error, right? Mm-hmm. So we finally get it right. But when we get it right, we don't know that process. So when we try to explain it to somebody else, we go, well, you just put your thumb here, you push the button, and you go like that. You can't, you can't do that. You've got mm-hmm. to be able to break things down step by step by step. And I try to do that with everybody. And when someone fishes with me, it's eight hours of this is what I'm doing with a spinner bait. I'm watching them, which is why I can never fish tournaments anymore because I, I, I'm always looking at somebody. I'm always watching the guy in the boat and making sure that he's doing what he should do and hasn't fallen in or anything like that. So I'm curious, how, um, how do you break down tidal water? How would you teach somebody to fish tidal water? Explain it to them. <clears throat> Oh, you guys must have a tournament coming up. Okay. So uh, so you have three edges to it. You basically, we're talking the Potomac, tidal Potomac. We're talking submerged aquatic vegetation. Hopefully, we're talking about milfoil, maybe coontail, maybe uh, water celery, maybe hydrilla. So in that order of preference, we like, to, we like to fish milfoil because it kind of grows like stalks. So you're always looking for milfoil because there's always a spot to drop a bait into. This time of the year, there's usually a bed. If you find three stalks, there's usually a bed in between the three of them. So tidal fishing, tides come in, tides go out. Water goes up, water goes down. Gives you three edges to focus on. You've got the outside edge when the tide is low. That's when everything moves to the outside edge. When the tide is high, they move to the inside edge. So you need to fish the inside edge. The process then of finding where they are on the tides that are in between is that you have to you have to be able to find where they are in that grass bed. So instead of going back and forth this way, I go into the bank, out from the bank, into the bank, out from the bank. When I start getting bites, I narrow down that zone. The problem with a lot of people that fish tournaments is that they go practicing and a week later, the tides are different. 
So they forget what they've learned. They just go back to the same spot and they try the same things and they're, they're not on the same tide. So you really have to pay attention. Make notes, write stuff down. In the old days, we wrote it down. Now it's like, let's see here. I got to type this in and no, make notes. I caught it. I caught it. It was cloudy. The water was was moving out really strong. The grass was leaned over. Uh, you know, you have to pay attention to those things. So tidal fishing for a lot of people is not paying attention to the tides. You need to watch what's going on there. And you also have to know that that's current. And when you have current, you want to throw into the current and bring the bait back towards you. A lot of guys just throw it anywhere, throw it anywhere. But uh, if you pay attention to that and bring your bait back, I would say that probably is really, really important. Probably three or four times out of 10, it's like the only way to get a bite is to make that presentation into the current and bring it back. The other times, it does, you can throw it anywhere and they'll just bite, this seems like. Steve, compare and contrast, if you will, for, for the people watching at home, fishing grass beds on like the Potomac River compared to maybe a, a tidal fishery that's more hardcover. Is it is it where you can keep going back to the same places every year or is it you have to rediscover them depending on the grass beds compared to like, I don't know, flipping a dock on the James River? Is it the same or is it different? Compare and contrast. I feel like I'm taking a final exam somewhere. Oh, my uh, goodness. You can see the books. Behind me. Yeah. OK, so the, a gra fishing grass is totally different because you've got another you've got an edge that you're fishing. OK, and we all like edges. And I want to impart something on you is very important. Mike Iaconelli won the Bassmaster Classic. I can't remember what year it was. It's early 2000s, whatever. 2003, New Orleans. <laughs> that early 2000s. Look, at my age, if you get the right century, you're good, okay? So Mike calls me up. He says, look, I need to get away. It's been really hectic. It was a really traumatic year for him, his marriage and everything. It's all detailed in his book. And so he flew in and he said, uh, he said, look, I saw a patch of clear grass. Do you know where this spot is? I said, sure. So we went there and we're pitching this grass edge and I'm pitching and I'm like, here I am Bassmaster classic camp and we're pitching the same grass edge. Well, all of a sudden he starts pitching about two feet short and I'm like, well, surely this guy, he just won the Bassmaster classic. He, he can reach it from here. You know, I should I get the boat closer. Should I ask him? No, I shouldn't ask him. So I asked him finally, I said, I'm pitching to the grass edge and you're pitching two or three feet short. He said, oh, no, I'm fishing to the real grass edge. He was paying attention to his bait. When his bait dropped, he was in grass and he started pulling it. When he left grass, he was about three feet from the edge. So he's fishing the real grass edge. That's where the fish really were. It's accidental that we caught him on the one that we could see, mm -hmm. but it was purposeful for him to cast two or three feet away. So fishing grass, always look for edges, look for points. Your grass now becomes your, your cover, okay? Your grass becomes your cover. It becomes a current break as well. We talked a little bit about that. For places that are mainly hard cover and docks, down current stuff, start to pick it apart. Look to where the fish could go. You know, I, I never throw that first cast all the way down. And, you know, I don't know where I picked this up from, but I never throw that first cast all the way to the bank and work it all the way out. I start at the end and I pick around the end, looking for where the branches might fan out a little bit, looking for that cover, looking for a place that if we spook a fish, where that fish might go. Mm -hmm. uh, I was fishing at uh, Lake Fork with Jay Yellis and we were fishing bedding bass and we saw this bass and every time we came up to it, that bass would, would leave. And so we wait for it to come back. We cast, it would leave. So Jay goes, cast over there by that culvert. So I make a cast over there, whap. I get the fish. I go, what was that about? He said, well, he watched where that fish went every time it left. And it went to a safe place to where we could throw a bait to it and he wasn't going to get spooked. And then he would bite the bait. So always look for those places that were, especially places where you have a lot of boat traffic. I mean, it's not like you go down to James and go, oh, wow, I saw a good barge. Well, I don't think anyone's found this one yet. No, they, they have. But and during that day, and I actually developed patterns for docks and barges, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, they got pounded. Monday, my dock pattern was not the pilings. It was in between the pilings because I, what accidentally I found was you go up to that dock and when you go you, you know, with a boat, with the electronics and the trolling motor, that fish gets as far away from the pilings because it's go, look, here comes that blue thing with a little thing hanging on the end of it. Get out of the way, get out of the way. And they go right smack dab in the middle. So Monday, those fish hear your trolling motor. You know, it's a trolling motor. I better get away from the piling. 
and you drop it right between the two pilings and you're going to catch your bigger fish that way. Well, the same thing happens on, on fisheries like the James, where you, you rely on the sunken barges, a lot of wood. When you come up to that, where did those fish go from there? Because you know they didn't stay there because the guy in front of you would have had his limit by now. So on those type of fisheries, I'm looking for that escape hatch, looking for that, that hideaway that they go to that may not be the most prime cover in the area, but it's a little place where they can go to hide for a little bit. We've been talking about grass. How has the grass been on the river like fr from 10 years ago till now? And and how has, I, and we, we get controversial on this show because we don't care. So you don't have to speak if you don't want to, but how has uh, the, the water quality and the environment with, with, with Maryland handling that? How has that been? Cause I know it goes in ebbs and flows and everything. Yeah. Well, let's, let's talk about national Harbor. So national Harbor, Woodrow Wilson bridge, those are the two biggest projects in the history of the Potomac River. They were constructed simultaneously within eyesight of, of each. They built a concrete plant to build the bridge in National Harbor, it used to be called Smooth Bay. So they had traffic going by all day long, back and forth, back and forth. It used to be a giant grass bed above and below the bridge. Mm -hmm. It was a giant. Everybody would drive over it, didn't know anything about it. Oh, it looks like a golf course out there. It was. It was the only place on the river that had a mainstream, main stem, middle of the river grass bed that filtered everything. So the grass would grow everywhere south and everywhere north. Well, the year after they broke ground, they broke ground in November. The following year, they had grass. The year after that, they didn't. And we haven't had grass on that flat since they built that bridge. National Harbor, at the same time, they built it. They put in like four or 5,000 hotel rooms. And they were really surprised that when they started flushing the toilets, there was no place for it to go. So they were to allow, I know, they would allow, and I'm saying they, all of them would allow the pumping stations in Piscataway Creek, Broad Creek, to dump raw sewage into the river when they got overwhelmed with toilets flushing and with, with water and flooding. Same thing goes in D.C. They would pump raw sewage in. So there were times in, in when I say recent years, I think last year, where mm. they put out health warning and said, don't go on the river, don't touch the water, don't swim, don't kayak, don't, you know, all these sure. crew teams that were out there practicing. So there's a lot of blame to go around. And yet it seems like the departments, uh, uh, Maryland especially, tries to find blame with anglers and attribute too much to angler influence, uh, whether it comes to the spawn or whatever, they attribute too much of the impact of anglers to, to things which are more based on environmental causes. Uh, Dr. Joe Love, great guy to work with. Uh, I don't know about some of the other people in that department, uh, how, how they feel about stuff. I know that they were, they're very willing to put limitations on tournament anglers, but not so much on commercial fishermen who are using haul seines that are designed haul nets. There are a thousand feet long. They drag them out a thousand feet. They're 10 feet deep and they drag them in water that's three feet deep. And somehow magically these nets just kind of rise over the grass that, that was growing and they rise over bass beds and they don't disturb, mm -hmm. disturb the spawn when they're doing this in, in March, April and May. So a lot of blame to go around, but the anglers are an easy target. And unfortunately they're not organized as a group. They don't have lawyers that show up and lobbyists that show up at, at um, Department of Natural Resources meetings. Uh, as far as the, as Virginia goes, I can't give enough uh, credit to what John Odenkirk and those kind of guys do out there. Uh, what John did with Lake Anna is amazing. Uh, Lake Anna, we used to call it the Dead Sea. Now it's like one of the best bass fisheries in the state. Uh, lots of lots of tournaments. And, you know, And I think John and Joe Love, most of the good biologists, they they really think their job is to get more people to fish. That's it. More people fishing. That's their job, and that's what they want to do. And we're lucky that we're lucky to have them. Mm -hmm. Steve, is if you look at a place like Gunnersville that literally gets pounded 365 days a year and a couple more, and it still has grass, it, it still pumps them out. It is it cultural down there to preserve those kind of fisheries compared to up here? Because I, 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 Jared and I have been talking. If they if they let the grass grow on the Potomac and you stock that thing with F one bass, it'd probably be one of the best fisheries in the world. But it's okay, just so weird yeah, how people approach right. it. 
you brought up two things. Uh, let's let's talk F ones. F ones. Uh, nobody thought that would work. F ones worked. Uh, the James River. I mean, if you want to catch a giant bass, you go to the James River. Ten years ago, mm -mm. Uh, Smith Mountain Lake. Uh, you know, uh, the F ones there at Lake Anna. They want to start putting them. Um, you know, Virginia, who was reluctant to to get along with that, to go along, mm -hmm. now has a program where they're stocking F ones. Now, the Potomac. I don't think that's necessary. The, the Potomac is a is a function of of habitat. Uh, we have very good spawns. All the numbers on the Potomac show that we have a good population. Uh, the problem is it's harder to fish. When half the river doesn't have any grass, that means two things. It means half the river doesn't have any grass. And, that, and the other thing is that everybody else that used to fish the, that half of the river is now fishing all the same half of the river. So you have a lot more people fishing a smaller area. Uh, I, I think the thing that we need to focus on, from, in my opinion, when I was on the Black Bass Advisory Committee, was that we needed to do something about that commercial hall saying. If we're really concerned about the spawn, if we're really concerned about SAVs, uh, subaquatic vegetation, then these are the people that we see what they do. And you can't, you know, because there's no study that says, oh, yes, uh, these hall saying nets rip up grass and disturb the spawn. Because there's not a study, you can't use common sense. And uh, mm -hmm. which they're proud of uh, in the upper management levels of some of these uh, administrative positions. Uh, what it would take to improve the Potomac, we it's just basically keeping it clean. Um, I think anglers have done a great job. Uh, even though I don't fish tournaments, I'm a huge supporter of tournaments because you know technically, if you're fishing a tournament, you could take five fish home with you and eat them. Catch and release works. We have too many fish in some fisheries. I fish some lakes out in West Virginia where the I know the biologists out there, and, and they're telling me they're going, Steve, please take some home. Get people to start taking some of these fish home. We got we have too many fish because catch and release works. But I also remind anglers that if you start off with this year's catch, let's just use an easy number to 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 work with. Let's say this year's spawn produced a thousand yearlings next year. Well, the year after. That year class will probably be 800 year after 600, 400 till we get to the to the five, six, seven year mark where we're only going to be down to about 50 fish. When you go fishing, you're not looking at that base level to put in your live well. You're looking at that top level to put in your live well. Just remember that if you start complaining about not catching big fish, you know, it's the tournament guy that has to take care of those fish because they're the ones catching them, calling them, taking them on a boat ride taking them to a weigh-in and releasing them. Uh, in Virginia, we're lucky, I think, that a lot, of the, a lot of the tournament organizers have taken it upon themselves to do things. Right now, Maryland is considering uh, a, a catch, weigh, and release format for, the, uh, for all tournaments in the spawn and hmm. during hot summer months. Now, I've asked, are you going to make that mandatory? They'd rather not make it mandatory, but they'd like to make it a suggestion to clubs right. where it doesn't really matter that much. So clubs, you know, maybe they could drop their limit to, to three fish. Uh, maybe they could, uh, you know, cut their day short to about noon or one o'clock so they're not fishing in the hottest part of the day. Maybe they could just schedule tournaments outside of July and August. So those are things that we can do to, to improve things. I think fish care, the live wells are so good in most of the boats. I was not happy to see Bass Pro Shops come to the river last year in August uh, with guys, a lot of guys were, you know, nothing wrong with tracker boats. I've got a tracker boat, got mine in Bear Marine. They're great people to deal with. Uh, they, they're great boats, but their live wells are not the best. And you can't run from what, you know, it's not safe to run from Leeselvania to National Harbor because National Harbor doesn't have a boat launch. So people were launching at Leeselvania and then having to run all the way up to National Harbor, well, at 5.30 in the morning, that's not a big deal. But at 2.30 in the afternoon on a Saturday in a little aluminum, 17 and a half aluminum boat, beating your fish up, doing all that, I think it causes more harm than good. And by the way, I have a really good pattern for fishing release fish at National Harbor. <laughs> Talk a little bit about uh, safety and, and mention that too. Talk a little bit about safety for those that maybe have not ventured out on the Potomac. Uh, because it it it's definitely not your average body of water when when winds and weather sets in. Yeah, and that's winds and tides, winds and tides, and boat wake. So you got you get a little bit of all three. Uh, 
here's a little tip running shallower will keep you out of a lot of that chop so the current and the wind strongest in the channel if you get you could get out of that by going going a little bit shallower and uh, you won't have as much of a problem learn to drive your boat uh, I've had 26 skeeters that I've sold uh, every year. I've sold a skeeter. Wow. And I can say that only one guy out of the 26 said, hey, do you mind taking me out to show, show me how to drive this? And I've offered it to all of them. Take a boater safety course. Go out with a buddy that has a bass boat. Learn how to drive it. And I always wear a PFD. I, I wear an auto inflatable. I like the, the HIT, the hydro, hydrostatic inflation uh, technology. I like those. I'm still not convinced that they that they will inflate. So I wear one, but all my passengers wear just a regular type uh, type three PFD. So they, it's a vest type. They put it on, and it's always on when when the boat is uh, when the big motor is running. And if it's cold outside, if the water's below 70 degrees, I, I force them to wear it anyway because it also helps keep them a little bit warmer. Safety is important. Um, you know, just make sure that you, you pay attention. Kill switch. I mean, it's such a simple thing, you know, to, to put on. Uh, let people know where you're going. Have a float plan. You know, say, hey, I'm going, I'll be fished in this area. I'll be back at this time at this marina. Uh, so people go, know to go to look for you. And if you take kids out, take it easy. So I, I mentioned I, I travel a lot and I fish with other guides uh, and other local anglers when I go on these rider trips to write about destinations. And I always invariably get a guy who's like 23, 24 years old. He just got his, his you know, 21 foot bass boat with a 250 horsepower on there. His whole objective is to show me how fast he can drive it. Mm -hmm. So I tell him all when I get in, I go, buddy, we can get there in a minute, minute and a half, minute, 45 seconds, don't matter to me, we don't need to go fast. Speed is not not good. Learn your boat. Learn what it can do, and just drive safely. I, I mean, you know, you, you really hit it on the head. You got to really pay attention to the weather, the wind. Carry a weather radio with me all the time. Um, I have old Sparky on the uh, on the uh, Weather Bug app. That you know, if it tells me there's lightning within 50 miles, I'm getting closer to the dock, and then I'm watching it constantly to see what's happening because I've been stuck out there before we had all this technology. And had to try to battle my way back. And it, it's literally a battle out there. You can have four or five footers out there, yeah. wind coming in sideways, blowing rain, and you can't see where you're going. And it, it actually hurts. Hurts to drive that. I wish more people would pay attention to that. So last, last I guess let's go one more controversial topic before we get into the fun stuff. Um I, I've heard all the stuff over the years between Maryland and the anglers and the fight and the gill netters. What what is the lack of communication b between um, Maryland Fish and Game and the anglers too? I mean, are, are they are they truly against the anglers like some anglers grumble about when they talk about when we have the gill netters and we have they don't stock. They have tournaments out of mat, like small wood almost every other day. They, they allow that. Like, I, I feel like there's a huge disconnect and we're not all on the same page of what we all want. And I, I assume all of us want the river to be as healthy as possible. And I, and and Jared, I know like this is sometimes we had an issue with this with Virginia Department of Fish and Game in past years, and now they've really gotten on board, and they're much better than they were like you know five, six, seven years ago. Uh, what do you think the the issue is? Okay, so let, let me correct one thing. Maryland does stock; they do stock, and and not your fault. Nobody knows about it. They don't brag about it. They should. Why? Uh, yeah, they take. Yeah, they they shock up. They shock up uh, uh, spawning bass. And they take them to a pond and they hatch them and then they spread fingerlings out. Some of those go back into the Potomac. The spawning pair goes back into the Potomac, but they use it to stock other fisheries as well. So they do that. Are they against tournament fishermen? Uh, you know, I fought that battle. Um, and I mean, I played dirty. Uh, I'll admit it. I used every skill that I had to sabotage. They they put together what happened was a little history on this. They we had a, a group called the Black Bass Roundtable in Maryland. And we sat around one day and they said, Hey, we should have a permit for tournaments. And I'm like, okay, okay, makes sense. Well, what, what do you want to do with that? Well, we could collect data. How many fish were caught, how many were released alive, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that's good stuff. Well, all of a sudden they he had brought they had brought up a slot limit. A, what they call a fishable slot. 
where they said you could keep you, you could have fish between 12 and 15 inches you could only have four okay and only one over 15 inches jared wouldn't fish that thomas wouldn't fish that nobody would fish that would that and, mm. and you would lose Bassmaster. so mm. they sent out a letter to all the tournament directors and said this is what what's going to be but don't worry if you're grandfathered if you already registered we'll go by the old rules they said we signed off on it which we didn't and there were some key people in there so uh, i won't mention their names they you know people will find out who they were so they went ahead and sent this letter out and everybody went, no, oh, what are you trying to do? This is not going to work, you know? And so I, as the reporter, called Bassmaster and I said, what do you think about this? I talked to Gene Gilliland. I said, Gene, what do, you, what do you think about this? He said, well, we wouldn't fish a tournament like that. I said, well, you don't have to worry because you've already registered your tournament. So you're grandfathered in. He goes, well, we haven't registered our tournament. Whoops. So now Maryland was at the risk of losing uh, a Bassmaster tournament, which is worth a lot of money to him. So my mm -hmm. next call started to go to the economic development people. So what do you think about this? You know, so I really used all of my, you know, broadcast skills, my interview. I was a White House correspondent for a while. So I, I even interviewed President Clinton, you know, and I asked him some questions. He always gave me the same answer. Well, Steve, thank you very much for asking that. You know, that was his answer to everything I said. But I went, I went, I used my media hat. I went to these people. And yet still, in spite of that, they said, we've got to cover ourselves. So they decided to start this Black Bass Advisory Committee. So this is going on February, March, April. June was the first meeting of the Black Bass Advisory Committee. And at that meeting, they decided to vote on this slot limit. And they had, I again, I'm not going to mention names because there were people that, A, you know, with these committees, I could say out of the, the, the 13 members that we had, probably four came prepared. The others just showed up. They really did. They just wow. showed up. They, they might as well phoned it in because they didn't they didn't, weren't prepared at all. They were given a presentation by the Maryland DNR. The Maryland DNR recommended this. So they decided to go ahead and, and vote for it. And it passed. They were, they were going to you know implement that slot limit. Well, I, this is, you know, and I wasn't able to be at that meeting. I had to participate over the phone and I kept hitting my button going, Hey, Hey, no, no, you know, you guys don't know what you're doing. So I went to the committee above us and presented to them. And I said, this was, this was not done properly. Uh, it, it's certainly not, you know, not something that anybody really wants. And that's what Maryland, I mean, I had some anguish from Maryland and Virginia come to those meetings and they sat behind me and they, they tapped me on the shoulder and they go, you just talk. We'll make sure nobody interrupts. And I said, okay, I like that. So I, I, you know, pitched the case for it. I said, you don't want to, you don't want to turn people sour on, on tournaments. You, if you have a mm -hmm. problem, let's talk about it. And at that time, Maryland perceived a problem in the data they were collecting. And you talked about grass earlier. The way they do electroshock surveys is they do the same spot every year. If there's grass there this year, they get a lot of fish. No grass next year. They don't get a lot of fish. That's a flaw. Okay? Doing it in the fall is a bigger flaw because by then, if when you do have grass, it's just you know overgrown so much and you won't be able to get a good shocking survey. Virginia, John Odenkirk, who I think has been shocking the Potomac for only about 10, 12 years, he does his in the spring and he does it in places where fish stage before they go up to spawn. So John had numbers that said, and D.C. had numbers that said, oh, everything's great. And Maryland had numbers that said, no, things are horrible, and we own the river. We're going to, you know, we got to do something. So I said, wait a minute, guys, why don't we do this? Why don't we put all three jurisdictions together? Have everybody come up with it? Well, they all said, well, I do my math this way, and I do mm -hmm. my math this way. And one said, I do my math this way. I said, well, come up with something that you guys can agree with. And they did. And they, they, it was interrupted by, by COVID. But they now are starting to work together on surveys. So that sense of urgency now has changed. Well, why Instead, is it there's this lack of communication? Because, like, I mean, to, to the best of my knowledge, I didn't know anything about Maryland stocking program. And it's so crazy that they're not they're not. It feels like they're, they don't either have the ability or they're not communicating as well just to keep us in the loop. 
I, I don't know if they consider it a priority. Uh, I know they're, you know, I work with them a lot and I write, you know, a lot of different articles. I, I've got a column coming out next month in, in Woods and Waters that talks about that, that situation of catch, weigh and release. Uh, I try to keep everybody updated on what's going on there. The stocking program, everybody was surprised at that meeting to hear about the stocking program. And we heard about it probably 10, 12 years ago. But the other problem they had with that Black Bass Committee, they just had a meeting last month. At that meeting, they had 13 members. They only had nine show up out of the, out of the 13. Only nine showed up. And I'm sorry, only seven showed up. So they just barely had a quorum. And out of the seven that showed up, three of them have been there for year after year after year. And these are all new members. They can't even show up for a Zoom meeting. Um, so I guess the communication, we were all supposed to be, the way I looked at that job is we were representing constituents. And right. we it's up to us to get that message out to the constituents. I'm no longer on that Black Bass Committee because all of a sudden they came up with a loophole. In radio, we called it being fired, but there in Maryland, DNR, they called it a loophole. They said, you're not a Maryland resident. You can't be on this committee. So they got rid of me and two other guys, and we were the guys. We never missed a meeting. And one of the guys, I used to always say, uh, Dick Barrick, was the smartest guy in the room. Uh, Dick was uh, was an engineer, and he was an environmental engineer. Uh, he's the kind of guy that uh, he got all that that those concrete reef balls built and, and planted in Smooth Bay. and uh, and he he helped raise the money for it. I mean, we lost guys like that. And, you know, they were collateral damage when I think really I was the one that had the bullseye. Yeah. And to your point, too, Thomas, I have seen some of that where, um, you know, in Virginia, even, you know, where like and even say technology with YouTube and some of the guys on, on the ground uh, that are actually in the trenches doing the work, you know, have that ability to be able to get that information out on a, on a platform. But then it's kind of like the, it's pulled back. Uh, I don't know if the bureaucracy or the people at the top or and I can understand, too, wanting to control the messaging. But at the same time, you know, I guess it's true of any industry or business uh, if, if they're micromanaging it or whatever. And I, don't, I don't know all the ins and outs, but I, I do. I, I can kind of relate to that. And I've seen that where I've seen them doing really great things to get the messaging out. But then all of a sudden it just kind of goes away. Because uh, the people at the top maybe pull back on it or what, you know, I don't, again, I don't really know. I'm not inside that, so it's probably not fair for me to say, but I would agree uh, there's there's kind of a disconnect or it's not cohesive or, there, you know, there's something, something off there. Yeah, and I think that the communication arms, uh, mm -hmm. you know, when you rely on, in Virginia, you rely on John Odenkirk to get the message out. You got a good messenger. Right. Uh, he mm -hmm. talks to everybody. I mean, no matter where he is, he talk, you know, he talks to everybody out there right. and lets them know what's going on. Uh, in Maryland, I think they they probably need to work on that, on that communication within, mm -hmm. within their department mm -hmm. and let the anglers know what they're doing. Now, to their credit, I've done a lot of videos with them over the last couple of years on fish care, live well maintenance and, mm -hmm. and those kind mm -hmm. of things. So they are trying to do stuff like that. Uh, but there's so much more that needs to be done. I mean, it is a requirement if you get a permit to launch out of Smallwood or any Maryland uh, boat ramp that your participants have to watch these videos now on fish care and how to how to put ice and you know how to you know things like I wasn't I wasn't opposed to the piercing culling rings because I used them. I used to sharpen them. I knew how to use them, and I didn't hurt the fish. If you see other people, it's ripping their heads off with them, and that's the picture that everybody sees. So now you go to non, you know, non-piercing yeah. culling devices. So they educate you on that and why they do that. And I wasn't opposed to it, but I didn't support it. I think that's probably the best way politically uh, for me it, to say that. It was the optics on those things was the problem, like you said. Yeah, yeah, and and I think you know um, I've caught fish that have had faces ripped open they look pretty healthy but it is something like I say it's it's all about optics i think we all need to, to communicate more um thank goodness we have uh we have local tackle shops that's where you know that discussion begins you have woods and waters magazine there and uh you know people need to read it read up on all these issues i know chris mccotter was very active uh with the concerned bass anglers of virginia when mm. they were trying to get uh something done and you know, F1s, and people need to understand about F1s. F1s are, all they do is they add bigger fish to your fishery. 
they don't they don't reproduce mm-hmm. and they don't they don't share genes but what it does remember that where you lose these top fish it supplements that and then some you're getting fish that you would never get from that original population of fish that you had because the f1s will grow bigger so it gets more people to fish and i think you know John Odenkirk came around. I, mean, he, I was opposed to it because all the research I saw, I said, well, that doesn't work because there wasn't anything that said it worked. Mm-hmm. John saw the same research, actually shared some of it with me. And then once he tried it, he'd go, huh, it works. And I think he's either written or is going to write a paper about that. And the good thing is maybe that'll be shared with, with other states. Uh, I see that. I mean, look what John did with snakeheads. And I'm mm-hmm. surprised you guys, we've been talking for what, three days and you haven't brought up snakeheads. But uh, uh, yeah, I remember the first. Yeah, you guys, yeah. Well, see, here's the thing about snakeheads. The first someone asked me, "said so What did you think the first time you caught a snakehead? What do you think it was?" And I said, "You know, it was, it was mean. It was ugly. It was nasty. It was slimy. I thought I'd hooked a lawyer, but, uh, but, but no, no. Wait, we, we, we cut it open. We saw it had a heart. We knew it wasn't a lawyer, right? <laughs> but that's been a big deal." And to me, it's still a big deal. The big deal is not what it's doing in the Potomac. The big deal is what anglers are doing, spreading it all over the place. Mm-hmm. That's a big deal. That that tells you a lot. The Alabama bass. I mean, you're familiar with that with that scenario where Alabama bass have been introduced into Virginia, and the Alabama bass hybridizes with smallmouth and largemouth. Alabama bass are smaller, but they reproduce faster. So what you end up with, no longer, you end up with a lot of fish, you starve out of fishery, and you end up with smaller fish. Well, people do that, they think, oh, it's just a fish. Well, it can mm-hmm. ruin a fish. And snakeheads, while it didn't ruin the Potomac River, it certainly has impacted other waterways that are a lot more fragile and a lot more finite. Don't forget, we have 63 miles of bass water on the Potomac River plus 12 creeks. That's a lot of water. And the snakeheads are kind of coexisting. Uh, according to Odenkirk, uh, they eat, their diet's a little bit different than largemouth. Mm-hmm. They're starting, the, the population is starting to level off because other things are going like, hmm, they look pretty tasty. Uh, people are eating them. Birds are eating them. Other fish are eating them. So that, you know, it's typical with the introduction of uh of an invasive, you know, you have this big spike and a surge in the population. And then after a while, it kind of settles out. We're at that point. But the scary part are the guys who put them in their live wells. And it's a federal offense to take them across state mm-hmm. lines. It's a lazy act. They take them across state lines and then release them into their pond or their creek. And it can be devastating. Yeah, and we're going to have Odin Kirk on here uh, shortly to actually talk about the snakeheads more because that is a fascinating topic about like, like I remember when they made horror movies, like B rated horror movies about these things jumping out of the water to eat you. And it's so interesting to see uh, borrow a Jurassic Park line like life finds a way and it always finds this equilibrium where it's not as bad as we we ended up thinking <clears throat> when, when the gobies came in, it was never as bad as we thought. I'm not saying you stalk them other places, but it didn't kill the fishery. It's so crazy how everything is so resilient um yeah you know, even the sopranos even the sopranos were talking about the snakeheads except they used a couple of choice words to join join the snakeheads yeah the the snakehead you know was good for my business for a long time because i had people that wanted to go fishing for them and um, found out these are the people who had never fished before but just wanted to catch one and you can't force feed them like that you've got to be able to set a hook and get them get them into the mm-hmm. boat and uh uh, I had a lot of fun with with snakeheads. Uh, we're not catching as many as as we used to. We used to catch, you know, four or five every day that we went out. Now we may only catch four or five a year. Uh, of course, we're not fishing. The kayak guys they're fishing in places where there are a lot of them. The bow fishermen have taken a hit on them too because they're out there harvesting those as much as they can. The commercial guys now have a market for them. They're getting I think five or six bucks a pound whole wow. fish wholesale. Wow. So, so there is a market and that's, you know, when we first started doing this, we all say all the local biologists got together, national people, you know, the national uh, park service, fish and wildlife. And we all said, well, let's tell them it tastes good. No, no, no. We don't want to encourage that. Well, now here we are, you know, 15, 20 years later. They do we'll say, taste amazing. <laughs> they, do, they do taste very good. I, I don't like fish, but uh, in fact, Odenkirk, uh, a guy from Field and Stream came down to do an article about me catching snakeheads. And so me being the marketing guy, I prepped a local chef and I gave him some snakeheads. I said, I got this guy coming from Field and Stream. 
and we might get your restaurant mentioned in here. Just cook us up this fantastic dinner. And so he played around with it and stuff. And then he, he finally told me, he says, you know, Steve, this is a restaurant. I don't clean fish in here. Please don't, you know, that was great. But you know, the next, I said, no problem. So I, I got Odenkirk. I said, John, can you, uh, can you harvest up some snakeheads and cut us some fillets and let's go have dinner and, you know, promote this thing. So we went out and did that and we had an awesome, I mean, I have never tasted that uh, walleye are pretty dang close, but I think, yeah. I think even walleye, walleye have their limitations as to the range of preparation with snakehead. My gosh, that fish had, uh, you could sweeten it. You could uh, put hot stuff on it. You could do all kinds of stuff that people don't do with walleye. Walleye still has that sweet, uh, sweet taste to it. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, we had John. We we had a good time, and and um, and he's done a really good job educating people on that. You might want to also ask John about water chestnuts. You talk about mm-hmm. getting the word out. Uh, water chestnut was, if you go back, you know, to 1920 and you see the whole Potomac River was just about closed. I mean, the entire river was choked off with water chestnut wow. and it, it's a highly invasive. It spreads. It's hard to kill. It's a, the seed pods last forever. And I was out with John and we were shocking up snakeheads and we were looking around and he looks in the water and he goes like, that looks like water chestnut. And so we scooped some up, put it in a bag and he sent it to, I think, to Nancy Rubicki with the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and she got back. She says, "Where'd you find this?" And John organized. I don't even know how many volunteers he had. And we got in the water in Pohick Bay and pulled it up by hand, put it in John boats in, in big buckets. Had those hauled up to a dump truck, and they they had, they dumped it or incinerated it or something. But we pulled it by hand. I think two years in a row. And John wow. organized that. And but he also knew that if he came to me that I would go to other people and they'd go to other people. And we said, Hey, we got this problem. So going back to your original question about why mm-hmm. don't we all know about Maryland stocking program? We should, we should. And the people that are, you know, responsible for that just aren't doing a very good job, I guess. And me included. Not really. I did a great job with that. When, when is an invasive species can have a positive, I, I guess, or can it ever? Cause I know like hydrilla, uh, it, it's not technically native to all the waterways, but you do see benefits. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, w- I know we're splitting hairs there, but it, but it's interesting when some things get introduced and we're fine with it, but the other things get introduced and as is like, Oh no, but this is, this is bad. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think John, um, John and Joe love have a slightly different opinion on this. Jo- John, uh, Odenkirk says, well, we've seen the, the results of the snakehead. It's not bad. Joe Love says, well, if we hadn't killed tens of thousands of them, where would we be now? Mm-hmm. So each has a valid point there in, in its own. Of course, I wrote a column about that. As far as other invasives, uh, they find their part, uh, become part of the ecosystem. Hydrilla, for example, yeah, it's, it's an invasive. It clogs up motors. It makes beaches, uh, you know, kind of like yucky. But it, it's what's called a pioneer grass. It, it clears the water enough so our more mm-hmm. accepted grasses will come back uh, mm-hmm. i don't i've never heard that before that's really cool i've never heard that before well you, you could quote me but i i'm you know paraphrasing somebody else you know actually that came up when the national park service uh they were they were they built i don't know if you know about this they built a jetty at hog around hog island and it goes about 1500 feet out to the maryland state line so they just built this long jetty out there and it hooks to the north because Back in 1930, 40, and 50, a company called Smoot Gravel excavated sand and gravel along the Virginia shoreline, and then the marsh eroded. So you have all these little bays now that are there that used to be marsh uh, that are eroded because of that. And now they put this this hook point back in to slow the flow of the water so it'll replenish the marsh. Hmm. Well, while they were doing that, they took the media out. And uh, I, I've read all the correspondence between Virginia, the uh, 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 VM, uh, VIMS and, and a couple other other groups that were out there. And they said, what's all this grass down here? And they dismissed it. Said, it's hydrilla. It's a nuisance. And somebody said, no, it, it's a pioneer grass. It, because of that, it clears the water. Not only does it provide habitat, but it promotes a healthy fishery for SAVs. So they had to explain their way around that because they were just dismissing it as as a nuisance. So we do have a lot of things that have been introduced. Uh, things change. 
uh, shorelines change, uh, channel creek channels change. Uh, water quality is about the only thing that we, you know, we're talking about invasives. If we'd spend more time talking about water quality than invasives, maybe we could get yeah. something done there. Yeah. Uh, but when you have a, you know, you have an open flush policy, you know, in the uh, with uh, with all the sanitation departments that they're giving carte blanche to, rather than having toilets back up in National Harbor, let's just dump it into the river. No, you know. That's amazing. amazing. You're so right about that too. It's how it's all, it's all about perspective. And here you have something that's going to filter your water and make it clean. Uh, and yet we have the same thing where I reside here at Lake Holiday, and it's the same sort of thing. Now it's not that they're flushing in, but at the same time, those those pumps and and the water when you get heavy rains, it can't handle it, and so they've mm -hmm. got to release it. And you know, by law, they're allowed to release so much of it without being fined, but you know, it's amazing how we can sit here and you know talk about how one is to your point, Thomas, one is bad. Mm -hmm. And yet we're on on the other hand over here, oh don't look, we're we're pumping raw sewage into, into this waterway. Yeah. But we gotta get rid of the the grass that your know, vegetation that is is filtering. filtering. It. So it's all about perspective and and uh, and sometimes sometimes I always like to say too, you gotta wait and see. Uh, because your initial thought, you know, in the example of snakehead, same thing, like you got to wait and see, cause yeah, it, it may, you don't know until time, time, time will tell basically. So. Yeah. You ready to switch yeah, gears yeah. to the fun stuff? Uh, <laughs> oh, finish your thoughts, sir. Finish, finish your thoughts, sir. Okay, sure. <laughs> no, but, but finish your thought. Okay. What do you, you want me to talk about fishing? Well, I was going to say, like, if if you wanted to finish your thought thought first before we before we switched it up to yeah, I, again, you know, I think our focus sometimes, you know, we're we're focused on non piercing culling clips. We're we're focused on you know fishing during hot weather months. We're focused on fishing during the spawn. Um, you know, maybe we should be focused on the environmental concerns. And mm -hmm. I, I'm not I'm not one that that wants to get in the way of progress. But when I saw the Woodrow Wilson Bridge and National Harbor projects taking place simultaneously and then saw the immediate impact of the SAVs above mm -hmm. and below the bridge. And I mentioned that was a filter. Well, spring waters are muddy. You know that, you guys know that. It comes down no matter where you fish, it's always muddy. Well, first we lost grass in Smooth Bay. Then we lost grass in Broad Creek. Then we lost grass in Swan Creek. Then we lost grass in Piscataway Creek. And we lost it down to uh, Greenway Flats. We lost the grass in front of Mount Vernon and up and down on both sides of the river that has not come back. And it's been over a decade, you know, needing to focus on that, you know, you go back to the pollution and all the environmental stuff. Maybe we should look at that rather than who's fishing during the spawn. That's right. That's a good point. Is there a way to actually rehabilitate it? Aquatic vegetation? Is that even a thing? Well, if you go back to the sixties, I get that's probably before your time, maybe. Oh yeah. <laughs> President President Johnson called the Potomac River a national disgrace. I mean, it when I was a kid growing up, there were signs along the Potomac. Don't go near the water. Uh it's toxic. The the one boat was called the Wilson Line. It would go up and down the river. And when the boat wake would come by, there was so much broken glass in the shoreline, it would like jingle. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we had, we had a really nasty, so they, they pa passed clean water legislation. Whatever they did back then was good enough to help revive the river along with that invasive, uh, hydrilla that came up. So yeah, there is a lot that you can do. I still, I fish a lot out in West Virginia and I am shocked. They have the, some of the nicest, most pristine areas that you'd ever want to go to. I, I got to a boat ramp this morning out, out at uh, in West Virginia, and I saw two big gulp cups. Half half of the beverage was still in there. People just left it right where they were fishing from the bank, right mm. there near the boat ramp. Trash cans everywhere, but trash everywhere, not in the trash can. We need to go back. When when I grew up, you know, and I don't know if Jared's even old. Do you remember the Indian crying and all that? Native American. They, they, well, they had this. They, they showed this Native American looking at all the pollution, just paddling through the river, seeing pollution come by and brought mm. a tear to his eye. That was that, you know, my generation, we saw that and we said, no more cigarette butts out the window, no more trash mm. at the stoplight. Mm -hmm. These people would open up their, their car door at a stoplight and dump trash out. We stopped doing that, but you still have a generation that's more concerned that you're using a plastic straw or a paper straw 
but yeah. it's what you do with it when you're done, you know, Amen. the things that you can do, you know, and if you can recycle, recycle, if you know, but, you know, we try to compost for no other reason that we're also gardeners, that helps. Uh, so whatever you can do, there are a lot of things. Long answer to your short question, Thomas. Yeah. Um, and I hate to say it, it, it becomes legislation for the big companies and it, and it becomes education for everybody else. And, and guys, again, you know, please like and subscribe to, 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 to Steve. And also, guys, again, get the word out. You know, talk to your local legislator, email uh, your department of fishing game. I mean, the biggest thing we started this was to have something that was completely separate that we can just interview and talk to people and get the word out about this. Cause I think we all been thinking it, but we don't collectively get, get around it. And Jared, you've mentioned it like trout unlimited. Those guys are in lockstep across the country to get stuff done as bass right. fishermen. We will argue about a color of a skirt before we will all get in a room yeah. and say like, could you please help our lake out? It, it's yeah. just it's shocking. And it made me think well, too, not- Thomas, you know, you, you know, and I just, I've been thinking as, as you guys have been talking, it's, it's, it's almost, it is our responsibility responsibility too and it's like mm-hmm. steve was saying too with these different groups um it, you know we can sit here and point a finger at somebody else at a department or whatever but what are we doing to help and i find that at the bait and tackle shop as well you know guys will be up in arms over you know the fishery or not catching fish or whatever and but yet what are we doing to help the process are we reaching out to the biologists to talk to them to pick their brain and like you, Steve, you know, when you talk to them and they, they talk about their data and let's say like on a Shando River, a spawn class, two or three bad spawn or a flood the wrong time of year, you're going to see that in year seven or eight when you want to catch those nice bass. And we would never think about that. We're just thinking, oh, it's something that happened last week or, you know, but no, it mm-hmm. happened mm-hmm. six, seven years ago. And the state has that data state. Those guys are very sharp. They're bright. Uh, not saying they're perfect either. That, and like you said earlier, trial and error. But at the same time, they've got a lot of data and a lot of experience on their side. So it's almost it's more of our responsibility to reach out to them and kind of bridge that gap. But I like what Thomas is doing, too. This is kind of a platform to get that information and knowledge out and, and kind of be that bridge between the state and, and our local anglers and, and, and fishermen. Well, it's it's also great that we have a local tackle shop like Jake's where people can go in there and and, mm-hmm. and talk about stuff like this. Right. Or, you know, if somebody's at somebody's at Jake's and says, hey, uh, have you guys seen a lot of dead fish on the river? You know, mm-hmm. where do you launch it? Right. Whatever it is, be be a clearinghouse because you can't go into uh, Bass Pro Shops and say, hey, you know, I saw a dead fish the other day. And they go, OK, great. Aisle three. You know, uh, right. it's not going it, to it's it's totally different because. I, I wish we had local tackle shops. I, I, yeah. don't, see, I don't see any. Uh, and a, and a point, you're, to your point, you know, when we're posting pictures and, and everybody likes to see the five fish, you know, holding up five big fish. Um, tournament's one thing, but, you know, then I, I do get feedback from some guys and, and they're, they're exactly right. You know, certain times of year on the spawn, that's not a wise thing to be putting those fish in your live well. And so I also write with Woods and Waters and I try to always – you know, speak to that, you know, okay, you can still fish, but let's get that fish back in the water. Um, we had um, Chris Gorsuch on, you know, he said he likes to use the hold your breath uh, technique where, you know, when you get the fish out of hold your breath, you know, if you start gasping for air, you need to get that fish back in. So anyway, but again, it's, 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 and where, where is that compromise? Where's that middle ground to where we can still fish, uh, but be smart about what we're doing and, and protect the fishery because, Another thing I like what Thomas is doing is, again, everything we're talking about is is the fish. And so what can we do to care for that fish and the environment that it lives in? Yeah, one of my pet peeves was uh, fish on carpets. And I wrote a, a nice note to a professional angler who had five spawning, you know, big spawners laying out on the deck of his of mm. his boat on the carpet. Mm. And I said, I sent him a note, you know, and I said, Hey, you know, you might want to take that down. It doesn't look good. I do that with lucky craft when, you know, we, we send pictures to lucky craft with fish that we've caught and I've gotten them. Hey, we're not, we're not doing that. We're not putting fish on the carpet, but I sent this one guy a note and he blew me off. So I went on his page on that post and I said, you know, it's not a good idea. And I referenced a study on that Mm -hmm. and I'd say, and he's well-known pro and all of his fans started attacking me. And then Mm -hmm. A couple of guys start to get back in and say, no, Steve's right. This mm-hmm. is not good. 
it's not good for the sport. It's not good for the mm-hmm. image. All the people I've had people I've been to the American Sport Fishing Association. They're located in Alexandria. And I've been to their legislative uh, meetings where we, we invite in uh, legislators, congressmen and senators so that mm-hmm. we can convince them to, to maintain the Wallop Bro Act, which is an excise tax. It puts money back into promoting fishing and boating. And I've been confronted by a kid who comes up to me. OK, I get off the water. I'm hot. I jump in the shower. I get a suit on. I put on shoes. I wear sandals. I wear temples all the time. I come there and I'm all hot. I got a tie on, you know, I shaved, you know, and I'm in there and and I go there and some kid comes up, sticks a poster in front of me, an anti-fishing poster, a picture of a dog with a hook in his mouth. You know, and my wife goes like, hey, uh, you better not do that. That's how he makes a living and he hasn't eaten anything. He's not in a good mood. And so Mike Nussman, the, uh, the uh, president of the American Sport Fishing Association at the time when he was giving his speech, he says, you know, it's all the protesters out there, but don't worry about it. All we have to do is give Steve a Snickers bar and it'll all be better. <laughs> uh, we have more people that don't want us to fish. You know, there's 63 right. million of us who like to fish, whether it's right. whatever it's for. And we should be more organized. If we were half as organized as Trout Unlimited, uh, we wouldn't have these problems. We need people to represent and step up. When the Maryland the you know, Black Bass Advisory Committee is more concerned about starting a trout trail than they are about what they're supposed to be there for. Really? I raise questions and they don't like it because I say, what does this have to do? Why is this a priority? Why is it even on the agenda? Why? Oh, we want the support of the Black Bass Committee. Well, for what? You know, because they asked me, they said, how many people come out and want to fish for a bass for bass with a fly rod. And I go, oh, I can count. Let's see, it's zero. Nobody wants to do that. They kind of want to, but then they see what they, they've got in front of them. They don't do it. So the priorities are a little bit askew. You've got people who are not involved. They don't come to, to the meetings prepared. The right people aren't stepping up. And Jared is right. You've got to get those people to those meetings, get those people involved and have somebody say no. No, no, no. That's not the way it is. We want to see the science. We want to hear from Maryland, Virginia, and D.C. Mm-hmm, before they right. push things down. We want to hear from the national people. And yeah, you know, they should get tournament directors to come to a meeting and say, hey, yeah, how are you guys? Or go to, a, go to a weigh-in and see how they're being done. Why doesn't Maryland send somebody to Virginia to watch Ed Dustin's mm-hmm. uh, tournament? Ed does a hell of a job with, with mm-hmm. his tournament trail. Of, uh, was it Potomac Battle Series or something? I've been to his weigh-ins. I've I've written about his weigh-ins. And Ed while we Ed always asked me, how am I doing? Am I doing it? Is there something I could do that's better? They that's want to good. do better. They don't want dead fish. Nobody that's wants good. Fish. Yeah, that's right. Hey, when are we get into the fun stuff. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I have a actually call into Ed. Hopefully I can get him on the show next. So he, he's he's part of the ever growing list. But yeah, I know people people are get sick of uh listening to all this environmental stuff that I like to just hit on every show, but yeah, let's get to the fun stuff about fishing this time of year. I know the spawn will probably be happening in the next couple of weeks or so. Like, uh, I guess for, for you in, in your guide service, um, what, what is going on right now in the river? You got, you got the pulse. Yeah, we, uh, we're seeing water temperatures in the mid sixties, which is really good. Some fish are spawning. Uh, and the nice thing about the Potomac is that we have, pre-spawn, spawn, and post-spawn, and that gets spread out all the way into mid-June before they're really done. The people who say that you shouldn't fish, you shouldn't target spawning bass, if you're fishing during those months, you're targeting spawning bass, whether you want to or not. Uh, I try to keep it simple for my clients. I try to have them throwing moving lures, lipless crankbaits are, are one. I have to mention man's baby one minus because it is that bait that, that you, everybody, no matter who they're sponsored by, has one tied on. That's a good bait to throw. Uh, chatter baits, swim jigs, jigs. There, it depends on the skill of the client. If they want to learn it, I show it to them. Uh, I'd rather fish with women, by the way, because they really want to win, uh, learn. And and the guys come out and go like, "Hey, I'm a guy. You're a guy. I can fish. You can fish. You don't have to. You just drive the boat, okay?" Um, but if I try to teach them things, I rely a lot on drop shot out there. And I, I like to say I've been probably drop shotting out there longer than, than most anybody out on the river. Um, I, I embraced it very early, adapted to it, uh, had a bunch of articles written about me and, and Bass Masters, about every Bass magazine, because I, I was one of the first to say braid with a 
with a fluorocarbon leader. I was one of the first to say, forget about, you know, nose hooking. I'm going to use a one knot wide gap hook and forget about these pretty little baits. I make a hand poured centipede that I use and forget about tungsten weights. I get a water gremlin bull shot and say that three times. I have a water gremlin bull shot and I use it as my anchor for the drop shot. I thought I was a genius. Everybody started using it. And now that I'm covering pro tournaments, just about everybody's doing it now. Drop shotting on the Potomac is, is for real and and it catches a lot of fish and it catches a lot of big fish. So we do have that going and pretty soon it'll be top water everywhere. Uh, a bait that I like to throw is basically, it's a, a Berkeley, not Berkeley, a Bagley's made a bait called a Bangalore, which was a jerk bait with a prop on the back of it. And you fish it kind of like a jerk bait. You snap it down, the prop churns up the water and then it kind of slowly comes up. Uh, Lucky Craft has one. They're the only other company that I know that has one. I like throwing those post spawn because it, it will get fish that are kind of lethargic, but still in the strike zone. Buzz baits are really good to start throwing in, in the post spawn. And then when the grass gets up a little bit more, yeah, the frog, the frog bite is, is really cool. Um, you can catch a lot of big fish doing that. Also, that's when you're probably going to get a snakehead because they tend to cohabitate in that very, very thick vegetation. As the vegetation uh, dies off and you go through the rest of the year, then you can, you know, start to pick grass clumps uh, apart. I call it like musical chairs. Uh, as the grass beds begin to break up, you have a clump here, a clump there, and and you just kind of, you know, and they all you know, find a clump. You used to have one fish, now that clump has three fish, and then there are four fish, and then you end up with all these fish going like, ah, no more grass, and they're out in the open. And for a while, they stay there. They stay up pretty shallow uh, as long as the water is above fifty which usually it is in the December, you can still catch them pretty shallow. And then after that, you pull out those silver buddies and, you know, put on a warm coat and get out there and catch a few. I've, I've also had success with the shaky head and I've had some friends. And what's crazy is like the finesse bite on the river it is, it feels like it's growing in popularity or, or maybe it's doing better for cashing checks. Is that because of the I don't know, like people are more educated about them, like like the drop shot. Is it because it's the pressure? Like, why is finesse on the river? Because it, it doesn't make sense. You think, ah, oh, you're gonna be using I know. heavy tackle and stuff, and you're sitting with your fairy wand and you're you're kicking butt. Well, remember we talked about lots of grass, a little bit of grass, everybody's fishing in the same spot. Um, a bait that can stay in one spot for a long time is the bait that that'll work. It's also an easy one. Uh, you know, don't forget the, the shaky head was kind of developed on, on the FLW co-angler tour. Those co-anglers were, were really good anglers and they're fishing behind a top level pro. And they used to, I, I mean, I interviewed these guys who wrote a lot about co-anglers and they were smart. They'd watch the, the pro and they go, he hit that piling. He hit that piling. And that means there must be a fish there. So they'll pick which they think is the best piling because they're only going to get one cast and they're going to put that shaky head there and they're going to shake it. And that boat's moving. The guy's getting ready to pull away to the next one. And they've kept it there a lot longer than that jig just dropping in and they're mm -hmm. going to catch fish. So a lot of guys are doing that when they fish behind other people. Shaky head is a great bait to throw. Uh, the Nico rig, another good one. Uh, one of my uh, fellow guides, Captain John Sisson. I, I said to him one day, I said, hey, you ever use the Nico rig? He goes, what is it? And I said, well, it's kind of like a wacky rig, but you put a weight in the end of it. He goes, yeah, I do that all the time. Been doing it for years. And he has. That's the way he fished the Senko. You know, he, he fished it like that. Uh, and same thing with the shaky head. Uh, uh, Wayne Olson, a, a guide, a uh, yeah. old guy, before she passed away, he he used to, I asked him, I said, you ever use the shaky head? He goes, What's that? And I go, it's a well, little jig and a worm. I, yeah, jig and a worm. I use it all the time, you know. So these things are around for a long time. It's just they kind of find their way where somebody says, you know what? I can't get them to bite the jig. I can't get them to bite the frog. Let me find a little pocket so at least I can get a limit. And then they start finding out they can get more than a limit. You don't have to, you don't have to shake your head a four inch worm. You can shake your head a 10 inch worm. The idea is that it stays in one place. For a long period of time it's not that jig dropping down getting reeled in drop down reeled in drop down people can the guys that, that come through there can just put it down there leave it in a really good looking spot for a very long time and the drop shot as well so they get a bite how, hmm. how long do things cycle so example is when the chatterbait came out it was literally i mean thrift was winning every tournament on it everyone had to have it and and then it it it's gonna have to cycle out of popularity the whopper plopper is a classic example of that everyone had to throw it do you believe that baits do that cyclical cycle? And do you think finesse baits go through that same type? So you asked a couple of questions there. 
Okay, so let's let's stay focused on this on the finesse bait. The finesse bait had has been around for a long time. Where it started to go away was when companies like LaRue and Zoom started mass producing baits. And they could inject thousands of baits in one day where the hand poured. Every bait when I was a kid was hand poured. You know, they had open mold and they pour the mold plastic, it, it cool, they put it in a bag. And cream, Nick Cream was selling lures that way. Mans was selling lures that way. Well, the mass produced baits had a slight flaw in that you really couldn't laminate them easily. Two tone bait, peanut butter and jelly, black mm. and blue, green pumpkin, watermelon. You had all these combinations because everything in nature has two sides, it has mm. two colors. The bottom and the top are different. And it may not match them, you might not have an orange belly and a black back, but they're different. And that contrast is pretty natural in the water. So the hand pour industry came back and became a cottage industry. Hmm. You could go to Lurecraft or any of these other companies and buy molds. You could buy the stuff to make molds. You have a favorite old bait, pour it down, pour the silicone on it. Now you've got a silicone mold and you can buy the plastics. You melt down old plastics. You can make your own baits. So they, they kind of stayed around and, all, and it kind of revitalized those things, the old jig and worm. Uh, you know, sticking a nail weight in a Senko, all those things, they never really went away as far as being a cyclical. Um, when Chatterbait was owned by Chatterbait, they, you know, there was there was a win early on. I don't remember, I don't remember if it was thrift or not, but it was really early on. He caught it pitching it. He was pitching that that Chatterbait hmm. and burping it off the bottom. Well, all of a sudden overnight it became a success. And guess what? They couldn't make them fast enough. So all of a sudden you had knockoffs. I mean, I was reluctant to get them because as a guide, I needed six or seven of every color, you know, because I had two clients and I got to make sure we don't run out. I couldn't find them anywhere. So for a while, I didn't I didn't go that route. And I ended up staying with like swim jigs. I went to swim jig route. Uh, spinner baits. I was talking about that today. The guy I was fishing with because we got to the water and, it was, and he, he asked me, my client asked me about spinner baits. He said, how come you don't hear more about spinner baits? How long have they been around? I said, oh, only a couple of years. You know, they've only been here for a couple of years. I said, spinner baits have, go back to when I was a kid in the in the sixties. Uh, you know, we didn't we didn't have what we call the safety pin type of thing. We had inline spinners, and we mm -hmm. we fished those. And uh, spinner baits been around for a heck of a long time. People have forgotten about them. Not many people throw them. And a lot of the new guys don't know when to throw them. They don't know. They don't know the difference between a, a long arm, short arm, a big Colorado, a small Indiana or anything, a tandem or not, not tandem. So cyclical, yeah. And it happens because of the tournaments, I think. When somebody wins on a tournament, it does make it popular. Mm -hmm. Somebody comes out with a YouTube video, it makes it popular. Mm -hmm. I know the giant, the giant swim baits, are, they're finding their way into mainstream. Yeah. And you're getting mm -hmm. people wanting to do that. It's almost a marketing thing too, like how if right. it's marketed, like you were saying earlier, you can sell it, and and that might be a picture, it might be a video, YouTube. I know the manufacturers have always said it's about six months. Is it, like the very very best bait might be a six month, and then they're looking at it as it's got to move in their warehouse. If it's not moving, they're not making money. Then they get it out and bring something else in. But mm -hmm. um, but to your point, Thomas, you know a lot of the old 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 reliables still work. Uh, but the new stuff works too. And, so, I mean, it's just, it, it is, it just kind of, and there's so much stuff now. It's, it's crazy. And, and Jared, I guess both of you guys have said this, like, you know, lures catch fishermen too. And, and like a, a big swim bait makes sense. It's a masculine thing to throw. You're throwing something that looks like a great white should attack. But then you see a guy out there dinking a little two inch worm. And it's like, it, it's so weird that you can sell that product to a fisherman. It has to be just because of the results. Cause it's like no man's man is going to be throwing a, a four inch pink worm out there if he had the opportunity. Right. Oh Yeah. <laughs> but you know it's all about pegs and shelf space and end caps mm -hmm. and, and if right. you can't dominate those you got to have something mm -hmm. new and then you have to have mm -hmm. a rep that knows how to sell it mm -hmm. and i'll say one thing about the fishing industry that the wholesalers the henry's and 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 some of the other ones they're they're pretty good at, at getting in and selling it but again mm -hmm. i go back to if i go into jake's and i say hey look i'm thinking about getting into these giant swim baits there's somebody there that's going to say oh mm -hmm. hey i'll talk to you about that I go in and, and, and ask Bass Pro Shops, and I love Bass Pro Shops. I have, I do seminars there. And, uh, but if I ask somebody there about giant swim baits, I, I'm going to get like, a, you mean like a money minnow? What are we talking yeah. about? 
You know, yeah, we, you know, it's, we it's, flew uh, Mike Buka, and I'm gonna tell you what, too. I mean, that that swim bait universe, my gosh, I mean, it's it's insane. Like, I, I'm not afraid to throw a big, but it's, I just never realized how much of a following and a cult that you know, for journey <laughs> that it is. It really is. And, and then, you know, they're coming in, it could be a, a one to two hundred dollar bait, and I know they run up to five, six, seven, eight hundred dollars, too, but. You know, a two hundred dollar bait. They're walking out with two and three of them. I'm like, this is crazy. But he said something was really cool too, though. He said, and, and it is true, it is the most realistic bait on the market. When you look at it, it's a it's a fish and it's swimming. And so, to your point, Thomas, there's a lot of stuff out there. You're looking at it and you're thinking, what is what does that look like? What does that mimic in nature? But um, so there is there is definitely a trout a, looks uh, like a trout. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And, and I, right. I'm actually, I'm actually uh, trying to get the West Virginia State record. There's a, there's a lake that it's about 63 acres. They stock it regularly with trout. They've, I've already got one nine and a half out of there. But last week I was out there. Some guys with a giant swim bait were out there, and they caught a ten and a half. And the state record is in the lake. The, the DNR has shocked it up, so it's there. And there are these, you know. 12, eight to 12 inch trout swimming around out there and you get that and the bass are looking for them. And I have seen in open water, 30 feet deep, not a, not a stitch of cover around. And there's a giant bass chasing a trout that's leaping out of the mm -hmm. water. And this bass is just going after it out in open water. Crazy. That would sell me, but it's, it's all these trends. They have to have, they have to be able to sell you the whole package. You can't right. just say to a novice fisherman, you go, Giant swim mate, go buy one. They're five hundred dollars. Go get one. Oh wait right. a minute, you got to have a seven foot six heavy action rod. Oh wait right. a minute, you better get some twenty five pound fluorocarbon, and it can't be the cheap stuff. You got to get the good stuff. Got to get some gamma. You know, you if you're, you're going to get a reel, oh you got to get a wide spool reel because you, you know that that mm -hmm. you know twenty to thirty pound gamma is, needs to take up some space on there. So it has to be the whole package. And if they could do that, then there's a then there's a market for that bait. But they've mm -hmm. got to be able to sell everything along with it and uh, right. to get it in the stores. Yeah. Well, we enjoy it too, though. I mean, it's, it's, it, you almost feel guilty, you know, like you're stealing candy from a baby. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, every last one of us, and I don't care the age, like we just love this sport. We love, you know, the, the chase, you know, going after the fish, catching the fish. And, and mm -hmm. so to your point, you're exactly right. You're just, it's something, it's a craft. Uh, it's something we enjoy doing. It's it's something new, something different. But mm -hmm. yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, well, and thank goodness we have these pros. You know, a lot of people they get mad if pros come fish their lake. Oh, the pros are out there ruined my life that weekend. Well, you know what? The pros develop the boats. They develop right. they develop the tackle, Little, the tackle yeah. boxes, yeah. the lines, the rods, the reels. Yeah. Everything that makes fishing enjoyable for you mm -hmm. came from the pro tour. It didn't start with you know, Johnny weekend out there going like, I got an idea. No, he, he might have an idea, yeah. but he never makes it in anybody's tackle box. Good the point. pros are out there. They, they, they show you that it can be used. And now that, that with all the cameras, they're all be having to be honest about what they're using and how right. they're using it. They do seminars on how to use it. I know Bass University, they have a lot mm -hmm. of seminars and stuff they do everywhere you go. There's more information if you want it. And, uh, people out there, if they want to learn this stuff, they have they much better than I did. You know, right. when, we didn't have depth finders when I was a kid. We'd lower the anchor. We had like knots on it. Let me see how many knots was that? Six, seven, eight. It's ten feet deep here. Oh, wait a minute, I lost count. Let me do it again. You know, but we didn't have the technology we have now. We have forward scan. We got you know side view. We've got everything. I mean, I you had, got the, you had Jaconis Jaconis two thousand depth finder. Mm -hmm. Jacobus. Yeah, that's yeah, right. All the knots on there, <laughs> or stick your rod tip down there. Uh, yeah, that kind of thing. But we're fortunate, and we're also very fortunate that a lot of the legends of the sport are still around yes. mm -hmm. and yes. accessible. Uh, yes. You mm -hmm. want to talk, talk to Woo Daves if he's there? You talk to Woo, and you know, you asked me earlier who was uh, my mentor in this business. I don't know that there was somebody that I that I looked up to in the business part of it. But as far as an angler went, I just, Wu was my guy. I, you know, mm -hmm. Wu was, uh, when I, when I met him, uh, it was the greatest thing for me. Cause I'd read, I, well, he didn't write books. He did, he did cassette tapes. Those were little things about this big. He stuck them in the thing, they had a little tape mm -hmm. on. Them. So Wu did those on how to, how to fish a worm. And that's how I learned how to fish a worm. And I met him several times 
interviewed him at the 2000 Classic. I was so excited. And I said, Wu, I'm going to make you famous. He goes, how are you going to do that? I said, Wu, I know everybody in D.C. radio. So I had him on all these radio stations. I was going like, now what's going to happen? So Wu was on almost every radio station in Washington, did a heck of a job. Very entertaining, very, you know, great stories. And it's guys like that. Rick Clun, they're all still around. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Mike Iconelli, he's very accessible. He's the biggest guy in the sport. You go up to him. And uh, the hardest thing I ever had to do is I was working with Mike and we were uh, doing Bass University and I had to walk him from one end of the venue all the way through the, sh the fishing show that was taking place to a stage. And he goes, get ready. I know, I know. So I'd start to walk up two steps. Somebody wants an autograph. Somebody wants a picture. Two more steps. I go, Mike, we got 30 seconds. Hey, can you guys hurry it along? But he he reaches out to every every fan. It's a very it's there's no other sport like it. There, are, yeah. I hope the younger guys that are coming into it mm -hmm. will keep that going. I don't know that I'm seeing that a whole lot. They don't know that part of the business. They don't know that there is some celebrity to this thing, and uh, you have to you have to be nice to your fans because they're right. the ones that buy the baits. They're the ones that the that the companies who sponsor you want you to be nice to. That's right. and, um, so that'll keep that'll keep the sport going. That'll keep introducing us to more products. That'll help us, you know, catch more fish. And that's what everybody's job is. Spend more money, catch more fish. That's right. Well, Steve, I have I have one more question for you. That one more. Just one? Yeah. Right. Yeah. I want to I want to keep us here before midnight. Um, does the whole river act independently of each other? Or if, if something's happening in Belmont, is it same thing down, you know, in a choir or, or, or does it? change depending on the season at different times well you know if you look at the river like i do now there's uh there's the northern half and there which is basically above uh, mount vernon and then you got the southern half so it's either grass or no grass grass fish generally behave the same and they react and it's basically they react to the tides like we talked about earlier uh the other end of the river is 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 wood cover hard cover a much more difficult thing to fish I actually may, had a pattern that I've been using for the past five years. There used to be grass in Broad Creek. Now there's no grass, none, not a stitch of it. Mm. There's still fish there. So at high tide, the fish move up to the bank. We talked about that. Well, where do they go at low tide? They used to go to the grass. Well, now they go to scattered pieces of cover. So I invested some time and marked any piece of cover. Hit the power poles down, say cast over there, cast over there. Okay, you feel that? You're in wood. You feel that? That's a fish. So that's what that's what I've done to adjust to those differences. So it is a hard cover or grass river. And basically the fish and the grass tend to behave the same way. Current might set up different areas differently, that you might have a lot of current all the way through the grass bed, or the current might only be in the center part of the grass bed where something's coming through there. Chickamauxin is 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 kind of like that. Madawam's kind of like that on those big massive flats. You'll have what we call strainers. We will have current coming through a grass bed. So those they, those grass beds become distinctive as having that where some of them don't. Do, do some areas, is it, when you, when you look at the tournament results and everything, is it because either the population moves or, I mean, are different parts of that, of the river hold different size fish depending on the type of year? And you don't have to give away any of the juice, but like how much do the fish migrate? I guess is my question on tidal versus a lake. Okay, they they do move around a bit, and when they used to do a lot of uh, tagging surveys, I was surprised to see mm. where fish fish would migrate uh, from Swan Creek, Piscataway Creek, and really wow up up into D.C. where the water was warmer. So wow, they would migrate they would migrate up there, and then they would move they would move down the river when they had a lot of grass. Now I think we just have more native populations. They go okay. to the, the the deepest basin that they can find, and that's it. Uh, as far as as far as uh, the uh, the way that you fish them as being different, uh, that really is going to depend on the season and, and what's going on. But most of the time, uh, I think if you spend more time on the water and, and play around with these things and pick a spot, because the average tournament win on every Bassmaster or major tournament has been very close to a three-pound average. That angler who wins that in a multiple-day tournament, two-day, three-day, four-day tournament, is about a three pound average. On our local events, somebody is going to get a four pound average. Somebody will get that every time. Mm -hmm. And that's because they, they were able to find those fish because every day you go out, there's a chance you could catch that. 
And on a major tournament, somebody will catch 20 pounds, uh, with the ex exception of, I know Thomas knows, who's the guy who, who fished at Blue Plains about three or four years ago? And about all this. Uh, Lucas. 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 Yeah, Lucas. Yeah. Okay. So Lucas broke that mold because he was in probably, in every pro I've ever asked, if you had to pick the best fishing spot in the whole world, year after year, any time of the year, a very small spot. Blue Plains is the best spot to fish. I can't believe he got that for four days straight, though. That was insane that he got up there four days in a row. <laughs> I know, but they was able, because that that shows you that in his league, they they you know people respected him. I I've seen other tournaments. It's like, well, I beat you there today. They're my fish today. Or mm. you can't have the whole length of the dock. You can only have these five pylons. So the high you know the higher tournament levels uh they respect each other with that everybody knows that's jay yellis's spot that's you know um you know whoever spot that's what he fished last year or five years ago um but with the local local tournaments the regional tournaments, the bfls those are usually one day events somebody's gonna gonna stumble on to two five pounders or three 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 or four three pounders and a five pounder and that can sometimes win a tournament for you and that's all it takes um and you know, I wouldn't want to discourage anybody from doing that, but it is, it makes it fun because your your top 10 guys are one bite away from winning. Mm -hmm. Maybe the top 15 or 20. Jared, you got anything? I, I'd tell you, I just, uh, Steve, I have just wealth of knowledge. I mean, and I, I got to say too, like you obviously have done so much for uh, the fishing industry and in, in our local fishery. And just, uh, we thank you for that and appreciate everything you've done behind the scenes to, uh, to facilitate that. And, uh, and thanks for coming on. If you can't watch this and learn something that you didn't know or something new, then mm -hmm. something's wrong. Cause uh, a lot of, a lot of good information, uh, this evening. Yeah. Well, thank you guys. I appreciate you finally getting around to having me on your show. I mean, I've been waiting. I, my wife goes, what are you waiting for? I'm waiting for the phone to ring. Yeah, I'm waiting for Aaron's to call me because he hasn't called. He's called everybody else. I watch his show and he's got like everybody and everybody, I mean, you know, gets invited, but I didn't get invited. Hey, you I beat, you beat Odenkirk though. Odenkirk, I did. coming on later tell, in the month, so him, you have to read I, him. I finally beat him at something, you know. That's right. I, I love fishing with John. We have, we have a blast and he makes the best venison. Uh, he's got a great story about a potluck dinner. If he wants to tell it, I'll let him tell it. But a potluck dinner in his in his neighborhood and and how everybody was enjoying the deer meat until they found out it it wasn't uh, filet mignon, you know. Right. So right. he's got a good story about that. Good but, stuff. Uh, well, yeah, sir, if you guys ever need anything, let me know. Well, thank you so much for coming on again, and guys, please. In the episode description below, all of his information will be there. Please like and subscribe to his YouTube channel. Go out with this man. Learn about it. He is the Yoda of the Potomac River. You can learn something from him every single time you're out there. And again, guys, please subscribe to Fishing the DMV. We are the largest, fastest growing uh, outdoor podcast in the metropolitan area. Just checked it the other day. So please keep it going. And we'll see you guys next time on Fishing the DMV. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.